A vaccine usually takes over 10 years to develop. But against all odds, in just eight months, seven vaccines are now approved for use. The first batch of vaccines arrived in Singapore on the 21st of December, making us the first country in Asia to approve and take in the vaccine developed by Pfizer and BioNTech. Vaccination is free for all Singaporeans and long-term residents, but it's voluntary. Will you take the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, if you've been in two minds about it, then you want to stay tuned. Because joining me today, I have top medical experts and Minister Lawrence Wong, who co-chairs Singapore's multi-ministry task force on COVID-19, and they're here to answer all your questions. This is a special episode of Talking Point. Minister, I'm going to start off with you. Why don't we just make vaccination compulsory for everyone? I think that's a question, Steve, that many people have asked. I think we should first recognise that very, very few vaccines are mandated, be it in Singapore or anywhere in the world. Even if you look at a vaccine that's safe and effective, there may be sub some segments within the population that are not eligible for the vaccine. And we also want to respect people's choices. So, Minister, have you had your shot yet? No, I haven't, Steve. Uh, we have worked out a prioritisation plan. We are going with healthcare workers, right. those in the front line, as priority. Thereafter, we get to the elderly, starting with those in the 70s and above. Cabinet ministers uh, and the Prime Minister, if we do it, we, we try as much as possible to follow the prioritisation protocol that has been put out. If we were to do it earlier, I think it gives some uh, confidence to the public that the vaccines are safe and effective and we want to encourage all Singaporeans and everyone in Singapore to take up the vaccines as well. So is it safe to say that all of you here agree that everyone should be vaccinated? Yes, yes, yes yeah. definitely. In fact, we will raise our hands for the vaccination but we just don't want to jump the queue. Well, before we go on further, let's take a quick look at the three types of vaccines that Singapore is bringing in. Singapore has bought three types of vaccines, Pfizer-BioNTech, Moderna and Sinovac. Both the Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna vaccines use what is described as messenger RNA technology. This involves injecting snippets of the COVID-19 genetic code into a patient. Put simply, it's a recipe to direct the production of a specific part of the virus, the spike protein, to trigger an immune response without actually exposing the patient to the virus. Both vaccines are said to have an efficacy rate of about 95%. China-made Sinovac vaccine, on the other hand, uses an inactivated COVID-19 virus to trigger an immune response when injected into a patient. But there is a lack of specific results on its efficacy. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is already being used in Britain and the US. Moderna's vaccine only in the US. As of 7th January, Sinovac is yet to be used by any country. So the Sinovac vaccine from China hasn't been as widely used and as we just heard, there's no conclusive study on it yet. So Minister, why did we pick that as one of the vaccines to be used in Singapore? Well, you have to understand that we started this process very early on. In the start of the outbreak, we knew that vaccines were important. And so as early as April, we convened an expert panel chaired by um, our head of civil service to look at how we can make early purchases of vaccines for Singapore. Uh, we have to make early bets in order for Singapore to be near the front of the queue for vaccines. And at that time, there is no clinical data available from, from any vaccine company in terms of full-fledged information. Only very early stage clinical information was available. From all the many vaccine candidates, they narrowed down to 35, and then they drilled down even more to look at safety, effectiveness, based on whatever preliminary data that was available then. And eventually, they decided on the tree. Uh, and that's a tree that we have made advanced purchases for, with the aim of building a diversified portfolio of vaccines that will be safe and effective for use in Singapore. And we have three now, but that's not the end of it. But which is safer? Injecting an inactivated virus or using the genetic code of the virus? 
I think we must understand that all the vaccines that are approved in Singapore are safe and efficacious. So we're not looking at is one, you know, in a way safer than the other and, and so on. Uh, but right now, the only vaccine that's available is the, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. At the same time, you will see that once additional vaccines come on board, there will be some vaccines that can be used in certain subpopulations. For example, the Pfizer vaccine uh, cannot be used in people who have severe allergic reactions. Uh, it cannot be used at this point in children below 16, in pregnant women, in severely immunocompromised individuals. Other vaccines might be able to be used in different populations. Okay. So we need to wait for more information. And it is which vaccine is more uh, sort of uh, applicable or relevant to that particular population if it's offered. Right. I think we would encourage people to get that vaccine. But in as we are talking about this, a new strain came about. Yeah. What's the point of taking no. the vaccine? Yeah, well, mutations occur all the time. So far as we can tell, it seems like it probably would still work. It's being actively tested. And we will know very soon because more than 2-3 million people now in the UK and the US have received the vaccine. One of our bioinformatics expert, uh, Dr. Sebastian morris -Rowe, he likens uh, mutations to like the uh, different number plate or colour of a car. The same make, same model, different licence plate. We see many of them all around the time. And sometimes, you know, you have, might have a car with new tyres, it might right. you know, be a bit more efficient, move faster and so on, but it's still the same make. At this point, there's no evidence that it has changed to another make, another model, um, another brand. We understand a nurse in California, after taking the, the first vaccination shot, was then tested positive for the yes, virus. It's the timing. It's too short. What do you mean by that? That means your, your body needs some time to develop an immune response. Right. And it's after the first dose only. Mm. So soon after she actually had the dose, she picked up the infection. And she may have actually been incubating at the time that she mm. had the vaccination done. So one shouldn't read this as though it's a vaccine failure. You have to wait for the vaccine to work. And it takes time. That's the other point that's important for the public to understand. Um, for example, the Pfizer vaccine um, specifically, you need to take two doses, three weeks apart. And after the second dose, it takes about one to two weeks for the full you know, uh, immune reaction to develop. So that means a total of about four to five weeks okay. after the first dose is given. Now, in between that time, that individual is still susceptible to, of right. course, exposure. And, and the, that's why it is important for us now in Singapore for us to roll out this vaccination program. Okay. Because when you roll it out in you know, a situation where you have, you have an epidemic, you have a lot of cases, then the situation that you had mentioned in right. like this uh, uh, person in the US may occur because you are trying to vaccinate while the virus is circulating. Right. It's much better to vaccinate when you have very little virus circulating such that if a virus should you know, be introduced in the future, you have a population okay. that is immune and is then you know, um, right. sort of uh, prevent any outbreak from occurring. So Minister, once all the vaccines are rolled out, will people be given the choice to choose which vaccine they want to take? At this point in time, we have Pfizer only. There's nothing to choose from. So let's go with Pfizer, get people vaccinated on the Pfizer vaccine. If later on other vaccines are authorised, be it Moderna or Sinovac, then we have to think about whether choice may be extended or as Vernon highlighted, perhaps some vaccines work better for certain sub-segments of the population and then we might allocate vaccines differently as well. I'd like to know if um, the government would help to co-pay my medical bills should I get any severe side effects from it. And welcome back. We've been talking about COVID-19 vaccines and, you know, personally, I'll take the vaccine because it will not just protect me, but also those around me. And of course, I want to keep them safe. But uh, some Singaporeans are still unsure about getting vaccinated. And we have some of their questions right now. There are studies showing that the vaccine can cause cancer and also effects on our health. I'm 73. I have high blood pressure. I have diabetes and I have poor kidney function. My concern is that I will get worse side effects than a healthier person. So very valid concerns from people there. The first one from Lisa, she was saying that it might actually cause cancer. So at this point, there's no evidence that uh, this vaccine will uh, result in uh, such a side effect. I mean, most of the side effects that we have seen uh, from the studies uh, are mild side effects and also um, 
the uh, one that has known, which is the severe allergic reaction in people. The mRNA uh, component itself does not incorporate into our human DNA. It, uh, in fact, after about 48 hours, just uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, dissipates in, in the body and, and disintegrates. So um, there's no evidence at this point that uh, there's any such concern. And Prof Hong, uh, the second question regarding those who already have existing health conditions, yes. they're concerned they may suffer more serious side effects. I think Annie has raised a very important point, but it's precisely that particular group of individuals who are older that have the comorbidities that she mentioned that tend to get more ill and tend to have a higher mortality. And it's specifically this group that we hope will take it up and get vaccinated. Over in the UK, after the vaccination is uh, given, uh, the doctors are uh, uh, monitoring patients. They have them stick around for a period of time, 15 right. minutes, they'll monitor them. I mean, is that something we plan to do as well, Minister? Mm. For sure. We will be monitoring very closely everyone who is vaccinated. In fact, the authorities are looking at data, not just from Singapore, but they are monitoring data from the vaccination program everywhere in the world. Clinical trials, when they did the Pfizer vaccine, right. Quite a number of those individuals were, in fact, individuals with comorbid medical conditions because these are the target group okay. um, for the vaccines because of the complications. And of the many millions of people who are vaccinated now, you know, in the UK, the US and elsewhere, uh, there's a huge diversity in terms of, you know, age, uh, comorbid right. medical conditions, etc. So there is a wealth of data showing that, you know, the vaccine um, is safe. Okay, we're going to take another question. It's impossible for us to know what are the three to five to ten year long term effects that it will have. Like for example, if and when I want to have kids, will it be harder to conceive? Like any other drug, vaccine, we will have to of course monitor over the longer term to see if there are any rare side effects that might occur. But at this point, there's no evidence that, uh, for example, ability to conceive would be an issue. How concerned should I be about long term side effects? The likelihood that there will be long-term issues, I yeah. think, is very remote. To play it safe per se, we have not recommended that if you are pregnant at present, you will take the vaccine. Right. Wait until after you deliver before you take the vaccine. Mm. I guess one of the concerns is also because things have happened so fast. Mm. There is concern that the vaccines may not be as safe as what was traditionally the actual clinical trials mm. process. Right. The reason the companies have been able to shorten the process are twofold. Number one, we are in a pandemic. There's no shortage of volunteers wanting to come forward. Perhaps not in a country like Singapore where the virus is you know, not raging, but in UK, US, there are no shortage of volunteers coming forward. Right. They all want the vaccine right now, right? And number two, they have been able to get these trials going on a concurrent basis, not trimming back, not compromising, but in parallel, and therefore shortening the time. So the entire process of validation, testing, trialling, looking at the data has not been compromised a single bit. So no shortcuts with that's right. Oh, right. That's right. right. Good Concern. to hear. We have one more question. Okay, let's listen. It. I'd like to know if um, the government would help to copy my medical bills. Should I get any severe side effects from it? Well, that's a, it's a very relevant concern. In fact, not just for COVID vaccine, but for any vaccination program. After we've authorised, we've ver verified that it's safe and effective, one can never rule out the possibilities of a very rare and serious side effect, effect occurring. It will be very rare, but it may happen. So we've been looking at this and we think that there is um, possibility of putting in place a vaccination injury assistance program where the government comes in for such instances to help pay for the medical cost okay. associated with it. So MOH has been looking at the parameters, the quantum of assistance, the conditions and the eligibility criteria. So they will be putting out details at in, in quite a short while. Do the authorities have any alternatives for those Singaporeans who are unable to get this vaccine due to their autoimmune disorders? How about young children below the age of 12? Uh, we, as parents, given a choice to say yes or no for children to take up this vaccine. Maybe I can answer both mm -hmm. of these questions first. Currently, for autoimmune conditions, it very much depends on the underlying condition. Um, in so far as the, as the testing is concerned, if the condition is under control, and the managing physician feels it's safe enough, we will probably allow it. Now, because none of these vaccines have been comprehensively tested below the age of 16, mm -hmm. for Pfizer in particular, we are not recommending it for children at present. 
we need to look at this holistically. Vaccine is just one part of a broader suite mm -hmm. of tools that we have to protect ourselves. So to the question, if I don't have the vaccine, is there anything else I can do to protect myself? Yeah. The answer is yes, many, many things. All the basic precautions that we have been um, putting out, advising, and that we have all started to cultivate good habits for, like hand hygiene, mm -hmm. uh, wearing of masks, maintaining safe distance. These are all ways in which people can protect themselves. Well, we have someone on the line who has just had her vaccination. Uh, Sarah Lim joins us now. She's among the first batch of Singaporeans to be vaccinated. All right, well, Sarah, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, we know you've just had your vaccination very recently. Talk us through the process. What was it like for you? Uh, it felt like an end bite at the point of injection. Uh, I was under the 30 minutes of observation to look out for any reaction from the vaccine, but there was none. Okay, well, Sarah, do stay with us. I'll just come back to the panel. Do we know the proportion of Singaporeans who had suffered any side effects uh, after taking the vaccine? So far? Yeah. No. no, no. So far, nobody? No, so um, from what we know, for the uh, individuals in uh, NCID who have received the vaccine, um, some of them have had uh, sort of, you know, the usual post-vaccination effects to be expected for any vaccine. And these usually okay. go away after a few days. I'm not sure whether uh, Sarah had experienced any of these. Yes, I experienced soreness on the first two days uh, around the injection area, uh, like any, any other vaccination. So on the third day, it actually subsided. I don't have any redness or soreness over the area. I do felt a little bit uh, tired, okay, but it was it was not unusual after any vaccination. But this is what yeah. Sarah has gone through, is yeah. the yeah. common uh, documented experience across millions of people around the world who have been vaccinated. So it's not just one data point. You look at America, you look at UK, many, many people, I mean, it's been just like what Sarah has gone through. It's right. a bit of an end bite. You experience but, a bit of soreness, a bit of tiredness, and then it fades away after one, two days. Right. And then you get on with life, knowing that now you are safer, you are protected. Once taking the vaccine, does it mean that I can travel out to other countries? Will I still have to wear the mask after I get the vaccine? With the vaccination, does it mean that you know, the way we play and work will change fundamentally? For instance, you know, the split team arrangements at work, to even social gatherings, and will we see that the return of entertainment like concerts? Right, so we just heard from a few Singaporeans there all asking, you know, how will this vaccine really change our lives? Can mm. we go back to uh, happier days, so to speak? But Minister, is getting a vaccine a guaranteed protection against COVID-19? Well, I think the level of protection for yourself when you are vaccinated is very high, as we have seen, right? It protects you based on the clinical trials, 95% efficacy. So if I'm vaccinated, I protect myself, but can I protect others? The answer is probably yes, yeah. you will reduce the risk. But to what extent will transmission risk be reduced? We don't know the answer yet. Mm -hmm. so, for now, for now, if any one of us were to be vaccinated, prevailing safe distancing measures will still apply. We still right. have to wear masks, we have to comply with all the rules. At some point in time, when we have more data, we may start to allow for some relaxation of the requirements. For example, it may be that we have a large gathering, say a MICE event or a concert which happens today, and we require pre-event testing yeah. for participants. Now, it may well be that somebody who is vaccinated, he can use his vaccination certificate and that will substitute for testing. Okay. That's entirely possible. Once taking the vaccine, does it mean that I can travel out to other countries? And once uh, coming back to Singapore, will I still have to serve any mandatory regulations such as the stay-home notice? Yeah. That's the one thing that's on many, many people's minds. Uh, if I get vaccinated, can I travel freely and there are two parts to this answer first when you travel abroad it depends on the other the receiving country's yep. requirements regulations we have no control of that uh, even without a vaccine today many singaporeans can already travel freely to other countries without a quarantine there because they regard singaporeans as coming from a low risk jurisdiction mm -hmm. right so i think with a vaccination it will certainly help but those are 
regulations that are outside of our control. But when you come back to Singapore, today you have to serve a 14-day stay-home notice requirement, 14-day quarantine. Now, if you have the vaccination, you travel to a high-risk place, you come back, can that SHN be shortened or even done away with completely? That's the big question. We still don't know the extent to which a vaccination can completely or how significantly it will help reduce transmission risk. So those studies are still pending. If indeed the data shows that transmission risk can come down significantly with vaccination, then certainly we will consider reducing drastically the SHN or yep. even doing away with it. Some are hearing that you know, flights may require that you be vaccinated before you can even get on board the flight. Yeah, it may be. Um, it's still too early to say. I know there are one or two airlines that have indicated they might require vaccination as a requirement. It may happen, but, uh, but you know, it's still early days. I don't think the entire air, airline aviation industry is, 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 is unanimous in moving in this direction yet. Right. Overall, if a larger number of the population, significant number of the population have been vaccinated and therefore are relatively immune to the condition, the ability of an infectious individual to then spread to a large number of individuals becomes significantly impacted and we will no longer see large outbreaks. But that required a large proportion of the population right. to be vaccinated. In the same I mean, what, what kind of numbers are we looking at here? How much of the population? There's no magic number that we can say at the moment because we don't yet have the data. But what we will know is that we will need high coverage. That means that whoever is eligible for the vaccine should get vaccinated so that we can reach that target a lot quicker and have that collective protection. Okay. No country is safe until every country is safe. Even if we have a very high percentage of people in Singapore being vaccinated, we will not be safe until the whole world is vaccinated. It will take a long time for the world to be vaccinated. Not one year, not within this year, for sure. It may take two years, I don't know. So the reality, this is a long fight. A vaccine is certainly a very important weapon in our arsenal but it's not a silver bullet. Because it's voluntary, we must expect that there will be some who will choose not to get vaccinated. Possibly, yes. What will happen to them? Will life be different for them? It could very well be. There will be these tangible benefits and those who choose not to be vaccinated, well, then you have to live with more frequent tests, you have to live with quarantines, you have to live with all of these other additional requirements. Mm. Even if we reach that sort of herd immunity or collective protection level, it does not mean that there will be no cases. So if you are not vaccinated, every single individual who is not vaccinated is another naive, susceptible individual who then can get infected by that disease. I think we also need to remember this is COVID today, but there will be future pandemics. Yeah. There will be a more, pot a more virulent disease X down the road. And so I think rather than thinking about let's go back to life before COVID, I think we should be thinking now about what's, what are the things that we have done during this period that really ought to be permanent, permanently part of our new daily routines and how can we uh, raise our levels of defences, our levels of protection, our levels of hygiene so that we can be more prepared and more resilient in the future. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming and sharing your insights on this. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all for joining us. We hope we've been able to address some of the questions and concerns you have with regard to the COVID-19 vaccines. And now that the vaccine is uh, rolled out and when it comes out to the wider community, we hope that you will also be encouraged to get vaccinated.